Privilege to have Brother Brent Gallagher join us this afternoon. Brother Brent is a graduate of Freed Hardman University and Harding Graduate School. Uh, he currently serves the Oakwood Church of Christ, Oakwood Road Church of Christ in Fairmont, West Virginia, where he has been for the past 26 years. He's also been the minister at the New Madam Morris Church of Christ and the Pine Grove Church of Christ. He is married to Janie Hickenbotham, the former Janie Hickenbotham, uh, her last name former Hickenbotham, and they have three children. <laughs> Please don't tell her I said that. <laughs> uh, they have three children, and uh, I'm privileged to introduce some of these folks that I've had a relationship with. And Brent is somebody that I've had a relationship with actually for about 28 years because I used to go to the Pine Grove Church of Christ. There's three things I remember about Brent. Uh, number one is he had this corny imitation of Rodney Dangerfield when he would go, no respect. <laughs> And he has a great imitation of Curly off the Three Stooges. <laughs> nick, nick, nick. But what I remember most about Brent, is this the introduction you were looking for? Yes. It's a roast. <laughs> what I remember most about Brent is the fact that he was the minister to Pine Grove Church of Christ when I was baptized. And within six months, he started a young men's group. And and we met probably, I don't know, a couple times a month, maybe three times a month. And he took opportunity and time with all of us that were new in Christ to teach us how to lead singing and study the Bible and to pre teach us how to preach and study the gospel of Christ. And Brother Bren, I'm so thankful for you and what you had done uh, in those young years with me. Uh, so what you see up here is part of you making an impact on me. Uh, for however you take that. Um, but, Brother Brent, we're very thankful to have you with us. Appreciate the end of that introduction. I thought it was turning into a roast there for a second. I wasn't sure what was going on here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's, it's strange. Years go by so quickly. I always used to hear these older preachers talk about how life goes by so fast. And uh, uh, I remember about 50 years ago, I taught Ed Malott. That's the first year I <laughs> taught up here. It seems like 50 years ago, but anyway, the years do go by. I appreciate the invitation. Glad to be here. And obviously appreciate the school and the, the other lessons I've heard and all the work it's done up here. In a lecture that deals with sir, lectureship that deals with certainty, things we can know, I get the topic of doubt. And uh, in all honesty, this is something that's really bothered me over the years because it's one of those topics I think it's sort of hard to put your finger on. And to some degree, it's, it's maybe a matter of semantics, whether we use the word we have questions or doubts. But how many questions are we allowed to have as Christians? Or how many doubts are we, quote, allowed to have? And what place does doubt or having questions have to play in our Christianity? The background of this is Luke, the seventh chapter, where John the Baptist is in prison. Commentators differ as to whether uh, he was there maybe a few weeks, perhaps as long as a year. Maybe, as some people suggest, close to a year and a half. I don't know. But I figure one day in prison is you know, enough in New Testament times. And so, in verse 18, the disciples of John report to him concerning all these things. Now, Jesus had been doing uh, tremendous teachings, uh, healings, uh, working in miracles, and so forth. And here's John languishing in prison. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, said to, him to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? I remember sitting in Bible classes where we just very easily explained this away. Well, John didn't lose his faith in Jesus. He was one of these disciples to have Jesus answer it for their sake. And, that, and that's a possibility. I don't think that's the case, but that is a possibility. So the men come to Jesus. They come to him and they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? In that very hour he cured many of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits. And to many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Now following this, as we... Um We'll see in just a second. Well, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, this is basically my lecture. As, as Ken said, he had stuff that wasn't in the uh, lectureship book. Mine is the lecture cut and paste. So, you know, you can look at what you want to. I noticed this, this, uh, this interesting relationship that uh, 
as to people, we use PowerPoint all the time, and, and a lot of people use their phones as Bibles, they claim, but I noticed on Sunday nights when the Steelers were playing <laughs> during church, there seems to be a lot more interest in my lesson <laughs> as far as what the Bible teaches, and maybe some of you preachers recognize that, that, uh, that uh, fact. But in the context, there's no mention of Jesus condemning John for his doubts. You know, Jesus didn't say somehow, what's wrong with John? That John has failed me, or why wouldn't he believe? But as we move on, there is a description following this in the next, I guess, uh, a number of verses there, about 12 verses, of the greatness of John. As soon as the disciples go back to John, Jesus goes to his disciples and so says, you know, uh, what are we looking for when you look at John? And you talk about the greatness of him, and also the fact that even as great as John was, no one born of woman has been greater than John. But who's least in the kingdom is greater than John. And then he goes on to talk about the instability, hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the lawyers that came out, you know, for whatever reasons. And so as we look at the, again, the immediate context, there's no specific mention that Jesus condemned John for having a doubt or having a question. The next slide, this is a man by the name of Elmer Towns. He posted this. It's in the booklet as far as the web address. But John, did John the Baptist doubt Jesus as Messiah? He suggests five different possibilities, and these sort of overlap, but... John the Baptist asked the question that whether Jesus was the disciple because his disciples needed strengthening. Uh, Luther, Calvin, and Beza held this view, and I've heard it you know, uttered in Bible classes many times. That might be the case. I don't think that is. But I think we do need to clarify that, that sometimes you know, these were human beings. We, I remember as a child growing up thinking that you know, all these Bible characters were people that didn't really have doubts or questions or rarely wavered. And, and I realized that's not truly the case, that uh, they can waver, and they could, did waver. John wondered whether Jesus was a great one because of his acts of meekness and mercy. And this is when you get into a discussion. Some people believe there really were two messiahs. Some of the rabbis taught that maybe there were two different messiahs. And if you think about it, many of the Old Testament prophecies, even as, as, as Brother Burton was alluding to, some of these talk about the Son of Man being a, a man of mercy, compassion, being offered for our sins, Isaiah 53. But he's also a, ju a judging king. Isaiah 59, verse 17, says he wears vengeance as a cloak. And some of these passages about the Messiah in the Old Testament show him the vengeful side of God. And so the, this rabbi I struggle with this, and they say, well, maybe there's actually two of them. And there's a possibility, and I don't know how, you know, it doesn't really matter. Maybe John thought, you know, there's going to be two messiahs. I don't know. John wasn't perfect in his knowledge at, at times. Um, obviously, when he spoke under inspiration, that was covered by God. But as far as his practice, if, if you look at the apostles being with Jesus three and a half years, and they preached concerning this kingdom, or they heard Jesus preach, but they still didn't understand after Jesus was resurrected from the dead. They said, you're going to restore that kingdom now. So there's a possibility that maybe John just didn't have a proper view of who the Messiah was going to be. John's faith may have failed as a result of his being in Herod's prison for months with no action by Jesus to secure his release. And I think this is the obvious explanation. Uh, you know, here you have these expectations of this, of this kingdom and the great things are going to be done. And all of a sudden, I've been stuck here in prison. You know, what's Jesus doing for me? John's patience may have failed, but it's not his faith in Jesus. In other words, you are the one we're expecting, aren't you? Then why not do something? You know, bring this kingdom in that, you're, uh, that I've been prophesying about or talking about and that you've been talking about. Uh, John was puzzled. Again, these overlap. John had prophesied the coming one would do some striking works of judgment, but Jesus was engrossed in works of mercy. Would someone else do these works of judgment? John wanted to know. You know, as, if you look at John the Baptist, what we have recorded of his sermons, um, his wasn't a feel-good theology. You know, his wasn't one of these, uh, I mentioned earlier, like a Joel Osteen type of sermon where everybody's smiling and health and wealth theology. His was one of repentance, judgment. He talks about about the, the fire, uh, the chaff being burned in the fire. And uh, his picture of the Messiah is somewhat of a conquering king, more so than a man of, of justice and mercy, or, or love and mercy. With that in mind, quickly we're going to look at just, uh, uh, this is from Elmer Town, did John the Baptist doubt Jesus as Messiah? What about this word doubt? Uh, there's not a whole lot of references in the Bible just actually to the word doubt per se, but there are, I believe, four or five different words, and they all have the concept of, of die in front of them, which meaning divided. A double, a divided mind. 
Generally speaking, doubt in the Bible is obviously either condemned or talked about as being a bad thing. And so when we think of doubt, we understand it's a person who is double-minded. Uh, we're reminded from James 1 where the person who prays, believing that he's really not going to receive that anyway, well, he's not going to receive what he's asking for because he's, he's a double-minded man and unstable in his ways. With that in mind, I think the most important thing is, and this is the thing that uh, obviously uh, I think many of us perhaps have struggled with or we have to question over the years. I know I have. Our faith and doubt always mutually exclusive. In other words, can you be faithful to God, believe there's a God in heaven, believe Jesus is a son, believe the Bible is his word, and still have questions, doubts, and maybe some serious doubts. And that's where this enters into a problem. I believe it's accurate to say that one cannot have and develop faith in Christ without doubt. Uh, you know, doubt's not a bad thing. If it weren't for doubt, uh, as we refer to it as the Restoration Movement, at least, it would not have started. People questioned what was going on. Uh, and people continue to question what's going on in religion. Questions are not bad. Doubts are not bad. The Bereans are honored as being more noble than those in Thessalonica, that they search the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. They didn't instantly accept things that Paul taught just because he was Paul. On the other hand, they didn't instantly reject what Paul taught. But they looked at the Scriptures. They looked at the Bible. And so the other passages we could look at, which deal with the, the need for rational thinking, um, I'm sure we're all familiar with them. You know, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Uh, reasoning, explaining, even in Luke 24, uh, Jesus, you know, explained to them. Uh, Acts 17, 2 and 3, there's three words in the Greek language where Paul was, I believe, in Thessalonica, I believe. But anyway, those three words, what he did in the synagogue for a couple of weeks, all involve reasoning, debating, rational thinking, looking at the evidence and drawing the right conclusion. So we understand then that, that Christianity is based on us using our minds and coming to the proper conclusion regarding God and so forth. And we can have confidence. We can have assurance that there is a God in heaven. Having said that then, then where does doubt come into play? On the other hand, Jesus rebukes some in his ministry for doubting. Uh, the familiar story of Peter walking on the water. Uh, you know, he doubts, and that's when he begins to sink. And he's rebuked by Jesus, Matthew uh, uh, 14, and verse 31. As I already mentioned, James says the person that doubts as he prays is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So as we see, as we, uh, I guess, long introduction to the lesson here, <laughs> see, that's what you always want to hear. A preacher gets about a half hour into his lesson. He says, now that I've moved on from the introduction, we're going to get to the, the meat of the, the lesson. That's the whole issue, you know. And again, even when we talk about the whole issue, doubt can go, it runs, a, 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 has a very broad spectrum. Maybe you're in a Bible class and you're teaching something and, and something comes up that, uh, or a question's asked that you can't answer. And maybe it seems to go against what you believe that verse or that passage to teach. Someone has a question. They have a doubt. You have a question. And, and that's a good thing because you want to go to the Scriptures and try to find out what the solution to that is. And we deal with this all the time and we just do it. It's second nature to us. This is how we study the Bible. But sometimes it can get a whole lot more serious than that. Sometimes if we, uh, uh, the death of a loved one, the death of a child, uh, unexplained tragedy in a family or a home or, or you know, violence occurs against somebody, uh, somebody walks out of a marriage and on and on. You can look at all the bad things that happen in this world. You know, where is God? Uh, why did God allow this to happen? And so doubts run all the way from the very serious that really do question our faith and is it really worth it type of questions to the point where, well, it's something we can figure out just by getting a commentary or two out and, and looking for the answer. There's a man by the name of Oz Guinness. I really wasn't very familiar with him. So I did start doing this study, and I guess his fourth great-grandfather has a dubious honor of inventing Guinness beer. So anyway, outside of that, <laughs> that name in Guinness, he has spent his life talking about doubt. Uh, he was an Anglican, but he left the Anglican Church because of its uh, theological liberalism. He studied under Francis Schaeffer, who was a big man in apologetics. And Guinness says this on page 27 of his book about doubt. Doubt's not the opposite of faith, nor is it the same as unbelief. Doubt is a state of mind and suspension between faith and unbelief, so that it is neither of them wholly, and is each only partly. This distinction is absolutely vital because it uncovers and deals with the first major misconception of doubt. The idea that in doubting a believer is betraying faith and surrendering to unbelief. And I like that statement. 
you know, by somehow we doubt. And again, I think doubt can be a euphemism for a question, something we just don't understand. But by, if we bring up that, un, that awkward question, no, one, you know, no preacher wants to hear in Bible class about a passage, that doesn't mean that you've given up faith. It just means we're trying to find a solution to this. No misunderstanding causes more anxiety and brings such bondage to sensitive people in doubt. And it might be the case. You know, it, it might vary from you know, church to church, person to person. But maybe some Christians have been you know, trying to have some difficult questions answered. They've had some doubts expressed. And the response very simply has been, put your faith in God, you believe in Him, and just leave it alone. And uh, maybe we you know, haven't accepted uh, uh, maybe questions as well as we should. Wayne Jackson says we can be assured that when we have troubling questions, it doesn't mean we have lost faith. It just means we need some answers. That's, that's an easy way to look at it. And I guess true. No matter what the question is or the depth of it, we're still looking for answers. Our preconceived notion or understanding of who God is or what the Bible teaches, maybe it's coming conflict with what we're experiencing right now. And there's a problem. And we just need some answers to that problem. Trevor Major writes, Doubt then is in some way an impediment to belief or faith. However, it's not the opposite of belief. It's not a denial of faith. This would be disbelief, that is, believing a claim to be false. Rather, doubt is a matter of unbelief, an occasional inability to admit a particular claim. And that's what we're talking about here. The struggles we may have uh, you know, in studying the Bible, uh, trying to harmonize or explain difficult things that go on in life with our view of God and what the Bible reveals about God. Sometimes these things come up and, and there can be a clash and a difficulty. Uh, a couple of Old Testament books, and I illustrate this. I'm uh, teaching the book of Job right now at Oakwood Road, and I said that's just a, a nice, depressing book <laughs> to go through. But you know, there, there's so much there, there's so much good in that book, and I learn something new every time. And it's 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 a book of paradoxes. You know, we serve a God who has revealed Himself to us, and He wants us to know certain things about Him, and we can know those facts. But on the other hand, there are certain things about God He has chosen not to reveal, and we can't know. And that's the paradox, and that's even the difficulty, among other things, in the book of Job. But even Job sort of explains this, this, this paradox in, in three verses. He says, I go forward, but he is not there. Job perceived, he had questions, he had doubts that God wasn't there. And backward, I cannot perceive him. He works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. So in these first two verses, Job is saying, if there's a God here, I, I'm not, I don't know where he is, because I, I can't sense him. He's not protecting me and so forth. But then notice the next verse. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. This kind of language is found throughout the book of Job. And uh, you know, it's hard to put ourselves into the position Job was in. But the reality is he had questions. He had doubts. He had misunderstandings. And as you go through the book, as you understand, God allowed him quite a bit of leeway in expressing those doubts and questions. Uh, you know, God rebuked him. Uh, I think there's a little question about that. But he didn't rebuke him as much as he did the comforters, as we know. And the comforters were uh, told to have Job pray for them. So again, the questions or doubts were there as expressed by Job. 13 Psalm verse 1, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? You know, David or the writer of the psalm just saying, God, you've, you've left me out of here where you know you've left where how long you gotta leave me out here hanging the book of Habakkuk of course is like the book of Job on a national scale you know the story uh Habakkuk praying, uh, Israel's a very wicked nation, saying, you know, God, do something about this. And I think Habakkuk tells us, among other things, be careful what you ask for. God might give you the right, <laughs> he might just answer that request. And God said, well, I've heard the prayers, and I know they're, Israel's wicked, so I've raised up the Chaldeans to destroy Israel. The Chaldeans were a very wicked nation. So Habakkuk says, they're worse than we are. And, you know, God doesn't give him, you know, some syllogism or some, you know, five, ten points as to why he's doing this. He doesn't answer him. He just says, the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk, I'm sure, struggled with that. He had questions, doubts. How can you use a more wicked nation to destroy us, even though we're wicked? And God still doesn't answer him. So Habakkuk closes that book with these three verses, which I think are one of the greatest statements of faith in the Bible. That we can have doubts or questions about certain characteristic of God that we don't understand as human beings and still not lose our faith in him. Though the fig tree may not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, 
The labor of the olive may fail, the fields yield no food, the flock may be cut off from the fold. If there be no herd in the stalls, I will rejoice in the Lord, I'll join the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, he'll make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hill, hills. Habakkuk's questions weren't, weren't blasphemy. You know, he was just questioning God, how can you do this? God chose not to reveal why he's doing this or how he can do it. Habakkuk accepts that, and he moves on and says, I'm going to trust in you regardless. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about faith and having doubts. We can still have a strong, vibrant faith in God and maybe not understand why he acts the way he does in this world. And yet it doesn't mean that somehow we've fallen away by having those questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Guinness in his book has seven families of doubt. And if you want to read about doubt and religion, Guinness has written two or three books on this, writes articles on it all the time. There's, there's more than you'll ever <laughs> even, even believe. But he, in dealing with this, says over the years he's dealt with so many people who have struggled with this, had doubts in their religion. And so he's tried to dissect a lot of this as far as, as why these things happen. This family of doubts, he calls her. There's seven reasons, he says, for, for doubt. And really, I believe he, he's, he's sort of hit the nail on the head. If you look at these seven reasons, they all get back to either not understanding who God is and the commitment involved in Christianity before we obey the gospel, or not growing as we should as Christians afterwards. Ultimately, you know, God and His Word have the answers to the questions we ask. And a lot of these, these doubts are families of doubts, as we will see, tie into that. First one is ingratitude. You know, if we truly have the, the, the thankfulness to God that we should have, then obviously, you know, uh, everybody be faithful to God. Everybody be, you know, present on Sunday. Everybody be uh, walking like Christ and we'd be all faithful Christians. But we don't. We forget. Just like Israel, you know, we, we forget very quickly. And so <laughs> sometimes we have doubts simply because we've forgotten who God is and, and are uh, ungrateful for what He's done for us. Second one's a faulty view of God. If you read the book of Job, we know Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar and Elihu to some degree all had a preconceived notion of who God was and how God treated people in this world. You sin, at some point in this life, you're going to suffer for it. And people are going to know about it. If you're righteous, God's going to bless you in this world. And, and people are going to know about it. And that wasn't a true view of God. Now, the true view of God is that God does reward the righteous and He punishes the wicked. But the reality is, sometimes that wicked, the punishment of the wicked may not come until after he, they're left, they've left this world. And on the other hand... The righteous may suffer many things in this life, just as Job did, and still their reward ultimately is in heaven. Asaph, the 73rd Psalm, he asked the same question. You know, I look around, bad people seem to prosper, things go real well for them, and the, the righteous seem to suffer, no one cares about them. And he said he almost lost his faith in God. He said, my feet slipped until I went into the sanctuary or the presence of God. And the two solutions to Asaph were, number one, uh, probably the wicked probably aren't as happy as we think they are. And maybe they are, but it, it doesn't matter. But number two, they have to answer to God regardless. And so the reality is, many times we have this view of God in this world that somehow it's like, a, 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 I guess say an instant karma. I hate to <laughs> quote a John Lennon title of a song, but it's like, you know, somehow somebody sins, God's going to punish them immediately. I'm faithful to God. God's going to reward me somehow through good health, material success, or something like that. And the Bible simply does not teach that. Same thing with Habakkuk. Do you have a faulty view of God? How could God, by my preconceived notion of God, how could God use a very wicked nation? What if God, and He may, what if He in His providence decides, I'm going to use ISIS to destroy America? You know, I don't know what God's going to do. We would say, how could He do that? Well, you know, we don't understand. We don't know God. And sometimes a faulty view of God leads to doubts. Uh, a number of years ago, I was talking to a family, and this is an adult son. His wife had left him uh, and ran, walked out of the marriage. And that, that mother, that, that, that son, was talking to him. And she said, don't worry, God will not allow you to go without finding a wife. And it was a difficult time, and it was a struggle uh, in their life. But, you know, the Bible doesn't teach that. I can't find anywhere where the Bible says that that person is going to be guaranteed of finding another wife. Perhaps he will. We don't know. But we have these views of God sometimes that we sort of superimpose upon ourselves that aren't necessarily biblical. And so sometimes we doubt or have questions because we don't really know who God is as he's been revealed in Scripture. Weak foundations, same thing, uh, Mark 4, we know the sower and the seed, how 
the seed that was sowed on uh, the, the shallow ground, you know, it just sort of first problem that comes along uh, that, that just shrivels up. Lack of commitment, a lack of growth, these are all tied in together. The point here is that um, in all of these, if we don't understand what we're getting into before we obey the gospel. Jesus, you know, on a couple of occasions uh, made sure that people understood uh, the need to com be committed to him. That yes, there's a blessing in following Christ. You have the forgiveness of sins, the hope of eternal life. But it's also a commitment. And make sure you're understanding that it means uh, bearing a cross daily, taking that cross up daily and following after him. Uh, the, the parable of building a tower or going to war. Uh, teach that point. And maybe we fail not teaching our children this enough. The, the understanding that when you become a Christian, uh, you're making a commitment and uh, life's tough. It's, it's obviously it's a whole lot tougher without uh, God or Christ, but they need to understand the commitment involved and the sacrifice involved in being a Christian. The next point he makes is unruly emotions. And I think this plays a large part in probably the doubts that maybe we experience. Look at Elijah. You know, if anyone knew the power of God, it was Elijah. You know, the, the, defeating the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And he had Jezebel chasing him. <laughs> he runs. Ask God to take his life. I don't know what all went on. You know, perhaps you know, I'm sure he was depressed. You know, God tells him to, you know, eat some food and so forth. But between what the facts were, as far as rational thinking and how he felt, there was a huge gap. And that happens in our lives. I don't care who you are, there's always a Monday morning, there's always going to be a gap between how we feel and what the Bible teaches. There's a passage over in 1 John, I believe it's the third chapter, where John writes about, if our heart condemns us, uh, God's greater than our heart and knows all things. And if I understand that passage correctly, he's saying, you know, you may not feel saved, you may not feel a certain way, some days you feel closer to God than others. It doesn't matter, God doesn't judge us by how we feel. We've preached that for years, uh, basing our salvation on emotions or feelings. Obviously, we base our salvation uh, or, uh, or our faith on what the Bible teaches and those facts. So emotions can come into play with doubts. Fearing to believe, and this is a strange one, and maybe, maybe J.D. will cover it. I'm not sure, but in Luke 24, 41, a strange verse. Um, this is following the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The apostles saw him and talked to him. And the Bible says they still did not believe for joy. I read all the experts, what they had to say about it, and they said it was just some difficult psychological thing. <laughs> so that really explained it. But you think about it. It says they still did not believe for joy. Guinness in his book gets, goes on this detailed explanation of, you know, that maybe we're so used to losing or so used to believing something's not true that we just assume it's not true because we don't want to be disappointed. I'm a Cleveland Indians fan, so let me use an illustration here. <laughs> okay. I grew up listening to the radio, listening to Herb Score on the radio. Every year, the Cleveland Indians, they'd be like 10 and 2 the first 12 games of the year, and then the next, you know, <laughs> the next 150, they'd lose. Every year, disappointment. They're in the World Series. I've already prepared myself for them to lose. I have. I've just assumed the Indians are going to lose. I have a fear to believe. Now, if they win, it's a pleasant thing, but if they lose, hey, I expect it anyway. <laughs> and to some degree, I think Guinness is saying, maybe this is what the apostles were saying. They sort of assumed Jesus really wasn't resurrected from the dead even after seeing him, so they struggled with, with this fact. I don't know. But anyway, regardless, uh, believe, uh, doubt can come about for, very, for various reasons. With that in mind, so we try to just uh, maybe make this a little more practical and, and uh, uh, go into about, a, I guess, a 10-minute conclusion. How do we deal with all this? Again, before we get into the conclusion, understand that you know doubts run a, a, a very broad. They cover a very broad spectrum. You know, some are a whole lot more serious than other. Obviously, uh, as I've said, some of these questions or doubts can be easily resolved. Others we might struggle with uh, in this life. First, realize it's normal for Christians to have doubts. Um, I believe John the Baptist doubted. I really do. I think if he was just, I think he was just exhausted in prison. Uh, Jesus not doing what he perceived Jesus should have been doing. So he's just saying, you know, what's going on here? Second, 
it's important to go to God and His Word. Um, you know, that's obviously where the answers are. If we have a faulty view of God, go back and study His Word again. See about His nature, His character. And uh, in the Bible, we have those, those promises that God will watch over His, His, Christ, His uh, people, those who are faithful to Him. But let's not con confuse that with health and wealth theology. That doesn't mean that my life's always going to be pleasant and that God's always going to just you know, roll out this, this real pleasant carpet for me. I remember reading a, a statement a number of years ago saying, if Jesus wore a uh, crown of thorns, why do, think, why do we think we should have a bed of roses? You think about that. That's just true. You know, we want this comfortable, you know, very uh, easily manageable life where there's no difficulties, no problems. And it simply doesn't happen that way. The other problem, again, uh, we get into sometimes... Uh, I guess that's the next point. Remember, there are some things about which humans are curious that God has not chosen to reveal every detail. It's hard to deal with the problem of evil. I mean, I don't, I don't lose my faith in God. It's hard on an emotional level. Uh, God does choose to uh, not intervene every time bad things happen in this world and in this life. But I know everything else in the Bible that talks about God's character and nature, God still cares. And I think there is an explanation. And maybe we understand it more as we go, get older. Maybe we don't. But regardless, maybe like Job didn't get an answer, Habakkuk didn't get an answer. And there's some things we're simply not going to get a complete answer uh, in this world concerning why God does allow bad things to, to happen, of course, to good people. The fourth thing is, realize that doubt is emotional, maybe always emotional. I, you know, I don't know if you can say this, but I guess if we were perfect human beings, we always understood everything God said and had perfect faith, and there'd be no, no emotion from the standpoint of having doubt. But C.S. Lewis made this point concerning the emotions, and I think it's an interesting quote. Uh, Lewis grew up some type of a Protestant background, if I'm not mistaken, became, quote, an atheist, supposedly, uh, turned to the occult and various things, and then became... A believer in God and, and wrote some very good things concerning uh, Christianity. But he makes this good point about the need to believe fact as opposed to how we just feel about something. Faith in the sense in which I am here using the word is the art of holding on to the things your reason has accepted in spite of your changing moods. That's why faith is such a necessary virtue. Unless you teach your moods where they get off, you can never be either a sound Christian or even a sound atheist. And I think that's true. And that's really the reality of it. Yeah, we're going to feel certain ways sometimes, especially if we're tired, sickness uh, comes in. Aren't those the times when we seem to maybe feel farther away from God, start doubting certain things, having questions? And again, that's just simply an emotional thing. God is still there, but I don't have that perception or that feeling. But another point, I say the fifth point, is don't allow doubts to go unchallenged or unexamined. The fact that I have questions... Um, uh, that, that I can't answer, or maybe the Bible doesn't answer uh, to my uh, liking, so to speak, doesn't mean uh, they can't be answered. You know, talk to another Christian about it. Talk to your preacher, an elder, or whatever. Uh, try to help through that, that period of doubt. Again, I think most doubts can be boiled down to just simply immaturity concerning Christianity, not understanding what Christianity is about. Uh, we're not actually growing uh, in Christ or these preconceived notions of who we perceive God to be. Asaph had a preconceived notion of God. Job did, or his comforters did, probably Job did too. Uh, Habakkuk did. And again, so why wouldn't we have maybe a preconceived notion of who we think God is and how he ought to behave in a given situation? And the only, again, the only way we can know that is what his word teaches us. And that's all that we can know concerning that. Did John the Baptist have doubts? I believe he did. I, I believe he doubted for whatever reason that Jesus was the Messiah. I personally feel he was just, he was just probably exhausted and saying, you know, are you really the Messiah? You know, I'm still in prison. Exactly what was the source of the doubts? I, I really don't know. Some may experience more doubts than others. Uh, Guinness in his book is interesting. He, he talks about you know, some people, maybe just by their temperament, their, their emotional makeup, may struggle more with this than others. And I think that's where those who, who don't struggle with it as much need to be patient. If somebody has a question or a doubt, you know, help them through that doubt. You know, take them to God and His Word and, and show them how, how that uh, can be answered. Um, also realize that if you have doubts, this is not necessarily some sign that you are not faithful or that you have uh, uh, apostatized. And again, maybe this is something we need to communicate clearer uh, to our people and to our children. 
you know, I was raised with a, a, a statement which there's a lot of truth in this, like you don't question God. Well, I understand that. I understand that from uh, the book of Job. But on the other hand, uh, there are certain things if we don't question, we'll never learn about God. And so that's where the, the trickiness with this subject comes in. We can't learn without asking questions and searching and looking for answers. But we have to realize that sometimes there's an end to how far we can. Uh, God has revealed himself. The problem of suffering, why Job was suffering, why God would use another nation, uh, the more wicked than Judah. God says, I'm not going to give you that answer. And so we need to stop at that point uh, and, and just sort of accept that for what it is. In doing that, I still believe God is, is perfect in His love, His justice, His mercy, and, and all these characteristics. But I may not understand that as a human being emotionally as I'm here uh, in this earth. And then finally, you know, why would anyone who's a Christian struggle with his faith or have doubts in living the Christian life? When I was younger, um, I remember thinking, boy, it'd be nice to uh, get to a point in life where, you know, you don't have any problems, no temptation, no difficulties, and, you know, just thinking, well, I get older, everything would be great. And uh, <laughs> it doesn't work out way, I realized. The reality is that this world's a fallen world where horrible things happen. Tragedies, incurable diseases, broken relationships enter into the lives of Christians. And sometimes Christians can say or do horrible things to other Christians. Uh, how many times have people quit God or given up, quit the church, all because of these things? The door to unbelief can be cracked open slightly, and one might begin to question his faith. And these are the crucial times, especially when we need to be prepared to face the challenges that are going to face us. But realize the place that doubt can play in developing faith, obviously, but also realize its causes and, of course, the different nuances of it and the danger uh, that comes with it. Thank you much, Brother.